Okay, so sorry for the delay. Hi, everyone. So my name is Yves Chedemois, White Chat on Drupal.org. We're going to talk about uh, field API in D8. This session is going to have uh, two sections. First section, I'll, and I'll try to go really, really fast on that one because I have uh, lots of things to say uh, on the second session, uh, on the second part. So the first part is going to be about um, site building orientated f new features in D8, uh, the one that you can like see and use in, in the admin UI to build your site, and the second part, uh, which is what this uh, session is going to be mostly about, it's, is about uh, uh, the changes in, in, in the APIs. So it's going to be uh, heavily, heavily uh, code-oriented. Uh, uh, so I'm uh, the, the uh, uh, field API maintainer. Uh, I was originally the CCK maintainer since Drupal 4.7 then uh, through uh, 5 and 6, and uh, we moved it to, to, to core in Drupal 7 and uh, uh, made a lot of work in D8. So that's like seven years stuck in field land. That's a little much, uh, but you get to refine and, and, and finally bring the APIs to the plans that you had in mind originally or, or do things cleaner and, and stuff like that. I also wrote, well, outside of field land, I wrote batch API, but that's nothing to be proud of, so. <laughs> okay, related sessions. Well, there was a Fagos session earlier today about uh, the more generic changes to entity API. So what we'll be looking at in this session is what happens inside an entity, mostly the fields. Um, there will be some overlaps. I will uh, uh, come back to a couple uh, points that you um, mentioned and refi uh, refine them a little bit or go uh, into uh, more details. And tomorrow at um, 2 p.m. you have a Plash, Francesco Placella session about uh, entity translation. So I will touch on those issues because they affect and they radically improve the, the, the developer experience uh, on working with entities and fields, but uh, his session will um, go into much more details about that. So probably a, a, a nice session to go to if this one interests you. Okay, so site building features. Well, we added new field types in core so that you can, like in a basic uh, bare uh, Drupal core install, uh, you can use uh, more power to do uh, rich sites. The, the, the idea that was, uh, I don't know if you heard about that, this, the Snowman uh, project, who heard about that? Yeah, it, it was, so earlier on in the, in the D8 cycle, the idea was that, okay, Drupal Core, it's like really cool, it lets you, it's immensely powerful, you can do lots and lots of cool stuff, but when you download it and you install it, basically it does nothing. And you have to discover by yourself how to assemble all those Lego parts into something that actually makes sense. So uh, as in terms of discoverability and learnability, it was not um, ideal. So there was this idea about we should ship a, an install profile. We, we should try to make, to build an actual product with Drupal Core, with only the tools in Drupal Core, so, so that it acts as a demo site about the features and the possibilities of Drupal Core. The code name for that project was Snowman. It didn't really go, uh, go anywhere, but at least we now have in core more tools to do stuff. We have views in core. With views in cores, you can do a lot of, of, of stuff already. With new field types and the, the, the field types that got added, well, you can almost build a small, simple CRM or a simple uh, event site. Or, and the idea was not to have a, a full-fledged uh, featured product, but to have something that looks like something with features. Okay, you have this use case, how do you do that? Okay, we're not there yet. Core D8 will most likely ship with the, the, the installed profiles that we know and that are pretty useless. 
but at least we have more tools uh, um, in core to do inter inter interesting stuff. Um, so those new field types, as usually happens in, in Drupal, it's well, interesting stuff gets developed in core, in contrib, sorry, and then after that gets, some of it gets integrated into core. Uh, so that was the case with the, those new field types. It's not always the full uh, featured versions of, of the contrib modules that went in, uh, but uh, sometimes simplified versions. So we moved entity referenced in entity reference into core. That's very powerful for data modeling. It's basically this one is basically a full port uh, of the contrib uh, module. Um, so you, you pick you add the field, uh, you pick the entity type that you want to reference. Then on the next screen you pick a, a the bundles that you want to be eligible for that field, or you can use a view to def to dynamically define the set of entities that are eligible for that entity reference field. Uh, yeah, it's pretty powerful. One thing that didn't happen, that, that probably won't happen, is that we still have in core separate field types for image, file, image fields, file fields, taxonomy term fields, and those are basically entity reference fields. They reference an entity. They are still their own separate field type, mostly because UI-wise, what people want to do is, I want to add an image. I want to add a taxonomy term. It would have been awkward to force them to say, hey, what you want to do is actually add an entity reference field and then configure it to point to image uh, or file uh, entities. UI-wise, it's much simpler to have those uh, uh, field types as separate. We have a very simple date field uh, with a cool widget, uh, date picker. Uh, the more advanced features that were in, in contrib date module, like the repeat, uh, repeat date that lets you make recurrent events, for instance, uh, those will stay in, in contrib. We have a very simple link field type, a URL, a, a text. Uh, no support for internal path referencing. You can you cannot reference slash uh, node slash one or admin slash blah blah. Just a, an external URL and and a text. We have an email field type, very simple phone field type. Not much to say about those except you can have more powerful uh, tools to model your uh, your content types. Okay, one. So there was a very technical reason, and I'll, I'll, if I have the time, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk about this more in detail uh, in the rest of the presentation. But we had to, uh, so in D7, you know, you have this notion of reusable fields. You can reuse a field on several node types. For example, the body field is reused across several uh, node types. The, uh, a, a typical use case for a taxonomy field is to be to appear in several node types because you want to be able to class to use that uh, taxonomy term field in order to classify different types of content. And what you could do is reuse the same field across different entity types. You could do that. There was no actual real use case for that because reusing a field is basically is really about uh, making it stored in the same place in the same data bucket so that you can query across multiple node types. So you, ca you can make a view that fetches all the nodes that are tagged with a given taxonomy term. But you can only do queries across one single entity type. You cannot do a view that spans across nodes and users. So basically there was no use case for reusing the same field across different entity types. So we removed that and we have, we had, uh, uh, storage wise, we had uh, uh, very good reasons to do that. The outcome of this is that it appears a, 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 as a restriction, like if you define a field, you cannot, and you add it on, on node entity type, you cannot reuse the same field in users. You need to define a new field. What it actually means is that you don't need to clutter the field name with the name of your entity type. 
In D7, the moment someone creates a field name comment, the field name is taken for the whole site. No other entity type can use, can create a, a field named comment because it's already taken. And entity types are basically biz units of business logic, or business logic that are typically unrelated. And so it turned out that many country modules that uh, created their own fields for their own entity types to contain their own logic, well, they found out that they needed to put the name of the entity type in the field name to avoid clashes. And just in core, well, we have the body field on nodes, and we needed to name the body on comments, we needed to name it comment body, so that there was no confusion. So, right now, in D8, the body field on nodes is different from the body field on comment. Which means, API-wise, it means that a field name is not enough. A, 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 to, to point to a specific field, you need an entity type and a, and a field name. So, like in the field info field API function, that is a typical uh, API function to get the definition of a, of a given field. In D7, it was just field info field, field name. In D8, a specific field is a pair of entity type and a field name. Likewise, in HTML, in the default uh, field display, we used to um, put, oh, that's totally not what I wanted to do. No, okay. I don't, I won't use the pointer then. Okay, what, what we did what in, in the, in the uh, field theming, we put a div with the field name in the classes so that you can apply uh, uh, custom CSS rules. Uh, well, what we needed to add now is a, the second class that, yeah, we're talking about the body field of the node entity type, just uh, because there might be other fields in other entity types, completely unrelated, different field type, different blah blah, added by a contrib module you're not even aware of. Uh, might add its own field that name that has the same name. So the, the takeaway from that is fields are limited to a given entity type. They don't cross over. Other cool feature, well, absolutely no credit to take in that, but it's highly related to fields in place editing. Quite cool. On the node view uh, page, you can, uh, well, you have to switch to editing mode and you can you can access uh, field by field, directly edit the, the field values, and in that case, if it's a formatted text field, you get the nice WYSIWYG interface. We have fieldable blocks, well, beans in core, and of course, it's customizable. You can define your own block types, and each uh, uh, block type has its own collection of fields. Form modes. Just like we had view modes in, in D7, where you can um, uh, specify and you can customize different flavors for displaying an entity, you can define dif uh, different flavors for forms, which lets you do different forms with a different set of fields on each of them for the user registration form and for the regular user, user edit. In D7, we had to hack the fact that some fields, yeah, this one, it will appear on the user registr for registration form and this other one won't. It was quite hackish. Now you can have different flavors of forms for a given entity type. You can do short forms, with, with, which just lets you edit like two or three uh, fields. Of course, the only reason why this is valuable is that you can now hide field in forms. Uh, previously, you could, only, you could only hide fields when displaying them, but the one and only edit form for a node, it had to display all the fields because there were no other version of, of that form. And so you can now hide fields in forms so that you can do short forms. Um, well, what this means is beware if you configure a field to be required and you hide it in the form, 
it better have a default value configured or your form just won't let you submit any valid uh, node. Okay, UI wise, so next to the manage field and manage display tabs that we already knew, we, had a, we have a, a new manage form display tab. It, it behaves just like the manage display. We have two secondary tabs here and uh, here it's about users and you can configure just like on the display tab, you can configure the different widgets that will be used either on the default form, the user edit form or on the user register form. And you can reorder them, pick different widgets or different settings uh, uh, form by form. Which means that since the reordering happens on the manage form display screen, which means that the main screen, the manage field screen, is now just a flat list of the fields that you have in, in, your, uh, uh, in your bundle. You cannot drag and drop reorder from here because what, you, what would you reorder? You're not configuring the form. It's done on another tab. You're not configuring the display. It's done on another tab. So it's now just a list of the fields. It's where you add new fields and it's where you configure your fields data-wise. But configuring, configuring the form and configuring the display happens on a different screen. Other than that, field UI will stay probably the same as in D7. Sorry, no time. Okay. APIs. So the plan in, in D8, field API wise, at least as far as I was concerned, was basically that. Like, sit back, do nothing. Field API, well, we moved it in core in D7, it's pretty, it works. There was a huge win in making it from CCK to D7, making it work not only on nodes, but on all entity types. Pretty cool. The API was okay. Feature-wise, it was okay. You can always think of things to add or th things to tweak, but it, it kind of worked. So I was like, in this cycle, I probably won't be doing much. In instead of that, what happened was that. For the third time if you count CCK from the start, moving into D7, moving it to D8. Actually, moving it to D8 um, might count as two rewrites because of all the intermediate steps. Anyway, you sometimes get this feeling. But as I said, yeah, it lets you bring the APIs to a, a state that, yeah, this is pretty cool. Also, the nice thing that happened in that cycle is that uh, there were many more, much more people to help. So this is the shout out slide. So shout out to Swentul, Christoph de Jaeger, uh, Display Suite Maintainer, Andrea Mateescu, who both stepped up to be field API co-maintainers, Fago, Berdia, Plash, who worked heavily, heavily uh, on, on the new entity API that Fago demonstrated earlier today, uh, Plash on the um, Entity translation side, Effulgencia, uh, who does a lot of work all around core and helped a lot figuring out complex issues. Uh, also, quickly, what this brings me to is doing core, well, not only core, it's true for Contrib also, but doing core work takes a lot, a lot, a lot of time, a lot uh, uh, among a long, uh, a, a long period of time, like for several months or years. Uh, it needs, we need some funding. We need to make that more, more sustainable. The tools we have right now, well, a couple weeks ago, we didn't even have those. So right now, we're uh, making more and more use of the GitTip platform, which is really cool because it lets you set up recurring um, uh, tips on individ individual contributors. And it can be like very, it starts at 25 cents a week, but add it up, it, it makes, it helps make development a little more sustainable. The second uh, nice tool that we have is Drupal Fund Us, which is a kickstart-like platform specific uh, 
for Drupal projects. It's more for like identified projects, stuff that you can formulate in a, in a project way for a couple weeks or months. I intend to do to work on that and come up with that kind of deliverable. Who's up for that and helping me do that? So the 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 important thing is that I think we should. The important me message that I think we should promote now is like. If your company is making money out of Drupal, and we very much hope it is, well, it should comp contribute something back, either code, either help with documentation, or fund something, minimal as it is. There is a nice, uh, the, the Khan Academy has uh, designed a nice uh, funding model using GitTip. It's like each developer has $5 a week in the team that they assign to whoever contributor they feel makes sense, and the company uh, uh, pays the money to get it. But it's like each, each developer chooses who, uh, who, they, who they want to, to tip. Stuff that, yeah, I think we should try to promote that uh, more and more, uh, like on Drupal shops or, or companies that use, that use Drupal. Okay, first, big, big um, API change that happened in D8, CMI. So CMI is about, well, configuration management initiative. It's about putting our configuration in YAML files. Uh, YAML files being deployable uh, across environment. You can configure your site in, in, in your dev environment and push the, the changes to your staging site and push that to your production site. Configuration can, can be shipped with mo in modules, you can, your module has a config folder that it just ships a series of YAML files and the config on, on the module installation, the configuration is merged into the site configuration, like feature-like uh, um, abilities. And most of all, well, most of all, importantly enough, CMI gives the notion of con config entities. It, 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 it gives a nice API form standard API formulation of what is it being a piece of configuration, a view, a node type, a field, a, an image style. Each of those are config entities, and they are entities, meaning they are handled with the same API. You load and save them and manipulate them in the same way. Well, each of them have, has their own specific business logic, of course, and methods and things that make sense for being an image effect or being a field or being a view. But you, many, you have one single unified API to, ma to manipulate those, and it's the entity API. Save, load, the same series of hooks are involved, etc. When it comes to field API, what are our um, configuration items? Very briefly, our configuration is split into two kind of things, the field and the field instance. A field is roughly a data bucket. It's a collection of data. It has, a field has a name, it has a type, the type of data you're about to store in that. It has a cardinality, is there, is there going to be only one value or several values or an in unlimited amount of values. Now, as I said earlier, a field is tied to a specific entity type. And the instance is, well, a field definition as attached to a specific bundle, as it appears in a specific node type, for example. In there, you can find the label, the description, whether it's required, some settings. In D7, the field and instances, there were arrays deep arrays, hard to document, no auto-completion, and they were stored in uh, database tables, field config and field config instance. CMI means configuration is not in tables anymore. So, well, yeah, converting the, the field API to CMI, it, it took like one year and a half. It started in Batcamp. Uh, in 2011, 
and it was, the patch was committed earlier this year in March. It was an important conversion because Field API is tricky configuration-wise, so it, it had a series of interesting nasty cases uh, to, to run against the concepts of CMI, so, and we are still um, refining those. So, our configuration uh, structures, field and instance, are now config entities, as they should. The uh, entity type, the entity class for a field is field config, the machine name of the entity type field underscore config, and you will find the configuration items in your uh, configuration folder in field, field, the name of the entity type, the name of the field, dot yaml. For the instances, the entity type is field instance config, and the file is field instance, the entity type, the bundle, and the field name. It really makes sense. Yeah, oops. if you look at core right now, right now the class names are not exact, exactly that. We're cleaning, cleaning st stuff up, um, and the patch to get to those actual class names is not in yet. But in a couple days, weeks from now, those will be the actual classes that you will find. Okay, if you look in one of those files, okay, the field definition for the node body, well. You have the ID, which is the, the ID of the config entity, node body. Every config entity has a, a UUID. We have a UUID. We find the name of the field, the entity type, the type of the, of the field. For the body field, it's a text with summary, with summary. Settings, in this case, no settings. The name of the module that provides the field type. Whether it's, okay, locked, I'll keep of that. The cardinality of the field, whether it's translatable or not and a series of database indexes uh, for storage, none in that case. For the instance, well, what you find in there, most notably you, fi you find a reference to the field, which right now is a UUID, we're probably going to change that. You find the entity type, the bundle name, the label, the human readable label for, for this instance, the description, whether it's required, the default values, some settings, Basically, what, what, what you had in D7 in those field and instance arrays, but just structured, stored in a YAML file and structured as in an entity, a classed entity. So yeah, those files, those two files are quite easily easy to read and easy to change. Don't do that. Like, don't try to change uh, open the file in a text editor and change the, the type of the field. It will break badly. It's, anyway, it's not something you should do with, with CMI. You can ha uh, hand edit those files, and that was one of the goals. But you should not do that directly in your active store. You should take a copy, change that, or pull new from your uh, um, VCS pull new uh, new version of the config files and import that. We have you you have an, an import step because, well, a, f a field, unlike a views or unlike a, 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 a uh, an image style, those are just runtime configuration. Okay, I load a view and I ask it to do its job, which is doing a query and outputting the results. Okay, so I load a view. How should this view behave? It's stored in the configuration file. Okay, I'll do that then. It's just runtime run behavior. For fields, it's a little more complex because, because we have storage, and we need to create that storage, and we need to update that storage, or we need to delete that storage. So there is some housekeeping to do. So like, don't edit your config files directly and expect it to work. Drush comes with a nice uh, command that lets you actually do that, like Drush C edit the name of the configuration file, it opens the configuration file in an editor, and when you save, it goes through that import and process uh, steps. So, that you can do. Okay, <coughs> API-wise, how do you manipulate those uh, configuration objects? How do you create new ones? How do you update them, delete them? In D7, well, you had a dedicated API to create a new field, to update its definition, to delete it. And likewise for instances. 
and each of those API functions had its own associated hooks, which you needed to learn. In the eight, it's the one and only, only regular entity CRUD API. You create the entity, you provide the entity type, field config, you provide the properties, you save it. When you receive a given field definition, you can change a, a setting, change the cardinality, save it. You have a field you want to delete it, call the delete method on it. And it works the same way whether what you're working with is a view, is a, an image style, is a text format. You, many, you load and save them the same way. And you can um, interact with the process using the same hooks. So less APIs to, to learn. <coughs> okay, if we look back at the content of the instance, some of you may have noticed that, well, in D7, within the dollar instance structure, we have much more things than that, just that. We have the configuration for a widget. We have a configuration for a formatter in each one of the view modes available for the entity type. In D8, it's not stored in the instance anymore. So yeah, the problem with uh, display settings in D7, it was like it was scattered around depending on whether you were a field, whether you were an extra field. We have this notion of extra field, like, like things that appear in a displayed node but that are not a field API field, like poll results or like the language, not a field in D7, yet it, it can appear in a, in a rendered node. So it, had to be, it has to be configurable, so it has to be exposed somehow. That's what we called extra field. And for other stuff that might appear in a node, like field groups, like display suite, all of those has had to store the display settings in separate locations. For fields, it was in the instance definition. For extra fields, it was in a huge variable, in the variable table, U. And for uh, third parties, well, they, they needed to, to take uh, care of the storage of their settings themselves. And each of those with their own separate alter hooks. And it also meant that we loaded um, m m many more stuff in memory that than we needed to. Like, the moment you loaded a field definition, an instance, we loaded the, the, the display settings for all the view modes even though we were just going to save it, not even display it. And if you add, you, you multiply that for all the fields that might, be, that might appear in, in all the entity types in, on your site, it added up to quite a large amount of, of data loaded in memory for nothing. What we did in, this, in D8 was introduce another configuration entity it's something that's stored in its own series of files, which we called entity display. And it is a full recipe for displaying a given entity of a given entity type and given bundle in a given view, view mode. It lists a series of components, body, tag, field image, field blah blah, field group, whatever each with its own display settings. And so what entity view does now, entity view of a given entity in a given view mode, well, it finds the, revel the relevant entity display object and loads it. It calls one alter hook, it lets all module al alter that entity display as a whole, and then it injects that entity display object into all the rendering call stack like the build content method on the entity view, build, view builder that is uh, uh, supposed to build the render array, or the hook entity view, uh, which lets third party code add its own components, they receive as a parameter the entity display. They receive the settings for the different parts. So they can pull, just pull from it the settings of the thing they're interest, interested in rendering. What it looks like, it's quite simple. The, the important uh, entry here is the, the content entry. And it just lists a series of 
components. Some of them are fields, some of them are extra fields. And for each of those, it lists a series of settings. Quite simple. So you manipulate them. Well, you have an API function to load them. You have a set component method where you can put the, set, the display settings for a given component. Here, the body, the body field. We want it to be displayed with the text trimmed for matter using a setting of trim length 600. In the same call here, we say that the image field is going to be hidden. And we save it. And so typically, that's what you would do when you implement the hook entity display alter. Just before rendering an entity, you have the, pol the possibility of altering the display settings. Well, you would do a set component of something. And then when you have the job, when your job is to, dis to build the, the actual render array for displaying a specific component, you just ask the display for, OK, what are the, s the settings that were configured for that uh, component? Display, get component. You either get an array of settings or you get null if the component has been configured to be hidden in that entity display. And we have the same on the form side, entity form display. It, they behave just the same, but they are used to uh, uh, render our various form modes. But other than that, it's just, just the same behavior. OK, data structures, meaning field values in an, in an entity. There were a, a lot of changes here. Just as a small um, uh, re recap of, OK, what's the data model for field API? Well, a field value is a, is a list of multiple items. A field, value can be, a field can be multi-valued. <coughs> and in fact, we treat mono-valued field as a special case of multi-valued fields that have only one value, because code-wise, it lets us um, simplify the logic. Every field is, has, can have several values. Only some of them happen to have only one. In each of these items, we find a list of properties that depend on, on the field type. A field type is being, the text field type is being about, I have a text property and a format property. A number field type, number field type, is about, I have a value, which is just the number. A, a file reference field type is about storing a, a file ID. And the field values can be translatable. Meaning, in a given entity, you can have the values for a given field in English and the values of the same field in French. And they, they can be different. So if we summarize that in a kind of graph, so we have a node. On this node, like we have two fields. One of them, field foo, is a text field. So it has a value, which is the text, and a format. In English, it has, sorry, it has two items. And in French, it has only one. We have a field bar field, which is an image field, or file reference field, maybe. It stores FIDs, and it's not translatable. So it stores its values under a single undefined language, undefined key, and it has two values. So across all languages, the values of this field will, is, are going to be the same. Which means that, uh, syntax-wise, you accessed field values, and yeah, all of those were plain, dumb, stupid arrays, so you did node field foo, square bracket the language, square bracket the delta, square bracket the name of the property. Every, everyone's familiar with that model and syntax? OK, the first, if we look at things from top to bottom, the first thing, major thing that changed here in D8 is about the way entity translation is managed. It's now managed at, at the entity level, not at the field by field level. Meaning you get an entity, you ask for the translation of an entity in a given language, and you get something that has a collection of fields. 
the interesting thing is that what you get out of, the, uh, out of, out of this entity get translation in French is an entity interface. It's an entity. It behaves as an entity. And you can manipulate it as an entity. Here, access one of its fields. So this is how you access field values in D8, almost. Well, it's actually simpler than that. That's, that's what I mean. And the important thing is that it's a facet. All of those are facets of the same entity object. You're not, getting, you're not actually getting a different entity object when you, when you ask for the French translation. It's the same entity. It's just been like rotated so that the face that you're seeing has the field values in French. But it's the same entity. And it's always loaded and saved as a whole across all languages. You cannot do like entity get translation French save and say, oops, where are my English values? No, it's the same entity. We load and save all the values. It's only at a given point, which is the preeminent uh, language. So if we look at the, uh, our data model in D8, what we find at the external layer is first, first the language. For each language, we have something that implements entity interface. Then, below that, we have fields. Each of the fields have several items with delta 0 and 1. And in French, well, our field foo uh, field that was translatable has different values. And our field bar uh, field that is not translatable actually has the same values. And it's actually the same object. Internally, we don't create a new object to store the values of untranslatable fields across all uh, translations. When you, when you get the French translation and you ask for field bar, it's actually the same object that you would have if you asked for the English translation. It's less just um, memory optimization. And yeah, I said object because all of those are classed objects now. Instead of being dumb arrays, what you find it here are classed objects. The blue squares, the list of multi-values, it's a field item list interface. And the items themselves, it's a field item interface. So in short, when you, how, do you go, how do you read a field value in D8? Well, you get a node, you get the right translation, you address the field, you take the first one, and you get its value. That's not ideal, okay, syntax-wise. Of course, there are shorter ways. First, the, the translation, well, in most cases, you don't, you don't have to care about it. In most cases, it, the translation has been resolved for you. The entity you receive has already been uh, placed in the language that makes sense for the page you are viewing. So, most of the times, you just take the entity that you receive. It's in the language that, uh, that makes sense. If you want a specific language, well, at the start of your, your code, you can do entity equals entity get, get, get translation in the language I want, and then you can just do stuff on entity. Then, the blue objects, the field item in list interface, it's an object, but in, it, it implements array access in PHP, so you can use it as if it was an array. So instead of offset get zero, you can just do square bracket zero. And on top of that, if what you want is the first value, delta zero, you can just ditch that. It's implicit. So, and in most, of, in most cases, what you want is the first value. So you can just do now, node, name of the field, name of the property. Sorry, let me, okay. So we have the interfaces. On top, we have an entity, entity interface. Each field is a, is a, is a, field light, a list of field items, field item list interface, and each of the items, field item interface. In terms of actual classes, what we have is, well, the node is a node class. The field item list class, and each of the item has its own specific class, meaning an item for a text field has the class text item. An item for an image field 
as the class image item. And that's interesting because, well, those are class objects. We can put business logic in those classes, which means, for instance, on the field bar uh, object, which is an image field item list, on image field item list class, we can have a get target entities method that just loads the entities for you and just gives them to you. You don't have to manually for each the values, load the field, lo load the file, and, 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 uh, uh, and process it back. So each field type brings its own class with the business logic that makes sense. It's pretty powerful. In summary, what you need to get out of here, entity, it's an entity class. Entity get, tr get translation of a given lang lang code, it's also an entity. Entity field foo, it's a field item list. Ent entity field foo of a given delta, it's a field item. And syntax-wise, to access properties, entity, arrow field foo, square bracket, the, the number of the delta, uh, arrow, the name of the property. If what you want is the delta zero, you can skip the square brackets delta. Which means that in terms of code, you can do um, pretty handy, handy stuff. Like, well, in D7, when you wanted to iterate on all the fields of an entity and do something on all the fields of an entity, well, you needed to use the field info instance instances API function to get a list of all the fields that exist on that entity type and bundle. You iterate on those, and for each of those instances, you get the items, meaning the field, the values of this field in that entity, and then you do something on those items, and usually, for context, you need to provide as well the parent entity, the language of the field values, and the, the instance, the definition of the field which makes functions with a huge, huge, huge signature in D8. You can do, just do for each entity. When you for each over an entity, you, you iterate over the fields of that entity. So you get a list of field names and items. Items is an object of class field item list. You can call the do something method on that field item list. Or if you want to call a method that's not part of that interface, but that belongs to another object, you can just pass, uh, call a method on that object and pass the items parameter on that method. And you don't need any more the entity or lang code or instance parameters because field items are objects. They are smart. They know their own parent entity. You can ask them if you need them. You, they know their own lang code. And they know their own f uh, field definition. So we can simplify a lot of APIs. The moment you, you need something that does something on a field item or a field item list, you just pass that item, and you'll be able to work with that. Next big change, everything is a field. Everything in a content entity is a field. So in that presentation, I'm, as Fago said earlier this morning, under the, tem the term entity and entity interface, well, we have two big families of entities, the content entities and the config entities. Fields, the field API is about content entities. We're not dealing with config entities, except to store settings in there. But the entities that have fields and field values are the content entities. But in there, everything's a field. Node title, it's a field. Node body that you can edit in the UI, but that gets automatically created on each new node type that you create. It's a field. Field blah blah that you create through the UI, it's a field. It, uh, they, they work with the same interface. You work with them the exact same way. Okay, one drawback. If you want the node title, in D7 you did node arrow title. Now you need to do node arrow title arrow value. But the node class provides a get title method. So Okay, it's up to each entity type class to provide explicit methods for its own domain. Five minutes, that's terrible. Okay, the, the big gain in, in that is that we have a, unifi a unified set of uh, APIs and features. 
field translation. Everything is translatable, no title is translatable. Field access, the rules to, to determine field access, you have one single hook and one single API functions to determine the access rights to a given field. Validation and defining this, the constraints that make a value valid or not valid. Outputting values in uh, REST. Widget and formatters, how cool is that? Being able to for node title or for node the, the author field of a, uh, of a node, be able to use cool widgets, entity reference widgets that let you explore the list of users. In place ed ed editing, the fact that you can use widgets on formatters on node title, it what makes node title available in, in place editing, so it's pretty important. Entity query, field cache. Uh, field API in D7 had a field cache that only took care of field uh, values. Well, in D8, everything in an entity is a field. So the field cache is actually our entity cache. Boom, we have an entity cache. We can load entities from the cache without any single uh, database hit. Okay, so we had a couple uh, naming issues. What we settled on is, so we, we now, everything is a field, but we have different kinds of fields. So we have base fields, what we formerly called entity properties, like node title, node UID, um, node created date. They are defined in code. It's, they exist because some code somewhere says so and provides their definition. And they're much better for business logic. You want to use a base field when you have a field that has a specific meaning and that your class has specific code to handle the existence and to attach semantics to that field. And you have configurable fields, which is what we previously called fields, field API fields. It's stuff that lives in config, that's administrated through a UI. It gives you flexibility. You can add new fields on any entity type without writing any code. And properties are what you find inside. Uh, uh, what, what we call properties now, it, node title is not called a property anymore. What it's called properties is what you find inside a field item. Value, format, target ID. It's what gets stored. And so code-wise, we have split the support for the notion of fields. There's a, a, a core um, library that handles the field system, the notions of widgets and formatters, and it's really baked in, in, the, in the what is being an entity. It's taken care of by the system. So far and up to the seven, fields were just an, after, an afterthought. It, they were added on top of entities that weren't really aware that there was this notion of fields. Now it's really baked in what is, being, what is uh, an entity. And the field module, well, it's now only about handling the notion of some of those fields, they live in config, and we have a UI for that. It's not exactly, we're not exactly there yet in terms of moving code around, but we're getting there. Okay, so the important thing is we have a unified field definition interface. We have code, all of those unified features, they work with fields wherever they come from. Configurable fields, base fields, we don't care, we work with a field definition interface. A field definition, it's something that has a name, a type, a label, a cardinality, and we, do, we don't care where it comes from. In D7, those were the field and instance structures. In D8, it's unifying in a single field definition interface. So when you, you have a dollar definition object, you don't care whether it comes from config or whether it's a base field, you just use the interface to get its field type, to get a, the value of a specific setting, etc. So, it's, a, it's an interface. You get documentation for the properties in there, you get auto-completion in IDs, and it mostly abstracts the uh, tricky notion of the split structure of dollar field and dollar instance. Okay, I need to skip so Fago showed that earlier. This is how you define a field. In a, you define a base field, you define a field in code, in the code of your own entity type. Here it's 
the term, the taxonomy term. It defines a TID field, it defines a VID field, and it defines a name. The TID is an integer, the, other, the, the two other ones are strings, and there are more, of course. And getting field definitions, well, in D7 you had the field info fields, field info field, field info instances. It was kind of complex. Usually you needed to iterate on all the instances and get for each of those instances, instances get the field definition. What you do in D8? Well, you ask the entity manager, give me the field definitions for this entity type and bolder. Give me the, the field definition for this entity type, uh, for, for this field name. But you can do, you can, uh, it can be easier than that. If you're on, an, on, an ent uh, on a given entity, you're working on a given entity, you just call the get field definitions method on that entity. It gives you the list of field definitions for that entity type and bundle. You can get the definition of a specific field. You can even ask, sometimes you don't need the definition, you, can, you only want to know if it ha the field is present or not. It has field, well, I forgot the field name parameter for has field. And if you are working with a field item or field item list object, you can ask the field item uh, uh, its definition. So it becomes much more handy to uh, um, grab a uh, uh, field definition. Okay, formatters and widgets, I probably won't have time for this. Though be, uh, very, very shortly, those are, are, are now plugins. So it means in D7 providing a formatter, something that has the role of displaying a field value. It meant implementing a series of hooks. So, well, it was code soup because uh, it was lost within the huge amount of functions in your module file. Uh, and you only one, had one shot at implementing a, a hook. So if your hook wanted to implement several formatters, well, then each of those, of, of those functions had, uh, were basically a giant switch uh, to, to provide the code for a given formatter or that other formatter or that formatter. In D8, we have the plugin API, so field formatters are plugins. They implement a formatter interface. Really simple, you need to provide a settings form, a settings summary for the UI, and roughly, you provide a view method where you just receive a field item list interface, a list of field values. So if you look at the previous methods where the signatures, they don't even fit on my screen, here you just receive an item and you do your job on those. So it's one class, it's ni nicely self-contained. You can leverage inheritance, so you can have a formatter extend another formatter if they mostly share the same code but only with a slight variant. And you really want to uh, extend those classes from the format to base class. They are exposed, uh, so you, you need to let the system know about your formatter. This was the hook field formatter info hook, no more info, info hooks in D8. You use annotations and you put your class in, in a, a, a specified directory. So here, if, you, if we look at the number module, it provides in its plugin field field formatter folder a class named number unformatted formatter. The class has an annotation that promotes this class as a plugin formatter impl implementation. You give metadata about your plugin and you just implement the method. Here it's really quite simple, just a view element that iterates on each of the items and computes a render array which is just the value. Okay, I'll skip that. More complex formatter. Inheritance, the number of formatters. There are actually two formatters uh, at, the, at the bottom of the, sc the screen. They both extend from, one, from the same base class that provides the whole logic. There's one, just one different uh, method that uh, uh, different method that, that provides a different implementation. Working in, in a formatter, you have a get setting method to access the configuration of the formatter, and you uh, have uh, methods to access the field definition uh, of the field you are working on. Okay, I did roughly, yeah, three quarters of my presentation. So, <laughs> just uh, as a conclusion, so skipping widgets, just the same. 
field types. Field types are, pl are plugins as well. And the important thing is that the field types, what you provide, the class that you provide, is actually here the class of the green boxes. So, so the plugin class that you write when you write a field type plugin, it's actually the value object. You're writing the class of an object that knows how to handle itself. That's an important uh, uh, difference with uh, D7. And I guess I'll stop here then. <laughs>